Letter 87. Some arguments in favor of the simple life. I was shipwrecked before I got aboard. I shall not add how that happened, lest you may reckon this also as another of the Stoic paradoxes. And yet I shall, whenever you are willing to listen, nay, even though you be unwilling, prove to you that these words are by no means untrue, nor so surprising as one at first sight would think. Meantime, the journey showed me this, how much we possess that is superfluous, and how easily we can make up our minds to do away with those things whose loss, whenever it is necessary to part with them, we do not feel. My friend Maximus and I have been spending a most happy period of two days, taking with us very few slaves, one carriage load, and no paraphernalia except what we wore on our persons. The mattress lies on the ground, and I upon the mattress. There are two rugs, one to spread beneath us and one to cover us. Nothing could have been subtracted from our luncheon. It took not more than an hour to prepare, and we were nowhere without dried figs, never without writing tablets. If I have bread, I use figs as a relish. If not, I regard figs as a substitute for bread. Hence, they bring me a New Year feast every day, and I make the New Year happy and prosperous by good thoughts and greatness of soul. For the soul is never greater than when it has laid aside all extraneous things, and has secured peace for itself by fearing nothing and riches by craving no riches. The vehicle in which I have taken my seat is a farmer's cart. Only by walking did the mules show that they are alive. The driver is barefoot, and not because it is summer either. I can scarcely force myself to wish that others shall think this cart mine. My false embarrassment about the truth still holds out, you see, and whenever we meet a more sumptuous party, I blush in spite of myself. Proof that this conduct which I approve and applaud has not yet gained a firm and steadfast dwelling place within me. He who blushes at riding in a rattle trap will boast when he rides in style. So my progress is still insufficient. I have not yet the courage openly to acknowledge my thriftiness. Even yet I am bothered by what other travelers think of me. But instead of this, I should really have uttered an opinion counter to that in which mankind believe, saying, You are mad, you are misled, your admiration devotes itself to superfluous things. You estimate no man at his real worth. When property is concerned, you reckon up in this way with most scrupulous calculation those to whom you shall lend either money or benefits. For by now you enter benefits also as payments in your ledger. You say, his estates are wide, but his debts are large. He has a fine house, but he has built it on borrowed capital. No man will display a more brilliant retinue on short notice, but he cannot meet his debts. If he pays off his creditors, he will have nothing left. So you will feel bound to do in all other cases as well, to find out by elimination the amount of every man's actual possessions. I suppose you call a man rich just because his gold plate goes with him even on his travels, because he farms land in all the provinces, because he unrolls a large account book, because he owns estates near the city so great that men would grudge his holding them in the wastelands of Apulia. But after you have mentioned all these facts, he is poor. And why? He is in debt. To what extent, you ask? For all that he has. Or perchance you think it matters whether one has borrowed from another man or from fortune. What good is there in mules caparisoned in uniform livery, or in decorated chariots, and steeds decked with purple and with tapestry, with golden harness hanging from their necks, champing their yellow bits, all clothed in gold? Neither master nor mule is improved by such trappings. Marcus Cato, the censor, whose existence helped the state as much as did Scipio's, for while Scipio fought against our enemies, Cato fought against our bad morals, used to ride a donkey, and a donkey at that which carried saddlebags containing the master's necessaries. Oh, how I should love to see him meet today on the road one of our coxcombs, with his outriders and Numidians, and a great cloud of dust before him. Your dandy would no doubt seem refined and well attended in comparison with Marcus Cato. Your dandy, who, in the midst of all his luxurious paraphernalia, is chiefly concerned whether to turn his hand to the sword or to the hunting knife. Oh, what a glory to the times in which he lived, for a general who had celebrated a triumph, a censor, and what is most noteworthy of all, a Cato, to be content with a single nag, and with less than a whole nag at that. For part of the animal was preempted by the baggage that hung down on either flank. Would you not therefore prefer Cato's steed, that single steed, saddle-worn by Cato himself, to the coxcomb's whole retinue of plump ponies, Spanish cobs, and trotters. 
I see that there will be no end in dealing with such a theme unless I make an end myself. So I shall now become silent, at least with reference to superfluous things like these. Doubtless, the man who first called them hindrances had a prophetic inkling that they would be the very sort of thing they now are. At present, I should like to deliver you the syllogisms, as yet very few, belonging to our school and bearing upon the question of virtue, which, in our opinion, is sufficient for the happy life. That which is good makes men good. For example, that which is good in the art of music makes the musician. But chance events do not make a good man. Therefore, chance events are not goods. The peripatetics reply to this by saying that the premise is false, that men do not in every case become good by means of that which is good, that in music there is something good, like a flute, a harp, or an organ, suited to accompany singing, but that none of these instruments makes the musician. We shall then reply, you do not understand in what sense we have used the phrase that which is good in music, for we do not mean that which equips the musician, but that which makes the musician. You, however, are referring to the instruments of the art, and not to the art itself. If, however, anything in the art of music is good, that will, in every case, make the musician. And I should like to put this idea still more clearly. We define the good in the art of music in two ways. First, that by which the performance of the musician is assisted, and second, that by which his art is assisted. Now, the musical instruments have to do with his performance, such as flutes and organs and harps, but they do not have to do with the musician's art itself, for he is an artist even without them. He may perhaps be lacking in the ability to practice his art. But the good in man is not in the same way twofold, for the good of man and the good of life are the same. That which can fall to the lot of any man, no matter how base or despised he may be, is not a good. But wealth falls to the lot of the pander and the trainer of gladiators. Therefore, wealth is not a good. Another wrong premise, they say. For we notice that goods fall to the lot of the very lowest sort of men, not only in the scholar's art, but also in the art of healing or in the art of navigating. These arts, however, make no profession of greatness of soul. They do not rise to any heights, nor do they frown upon what fortune may bring. It is virtue that uplifts man and places him superior to what mortals hold dear. Virtue neither craves overmuch nor fears to excess that which is called good or that which is called bad. Chelidon, one of Cleopatra's eunuchs, possessed great wealth, and recently Natalis, a man whose tongue was as shameless as it was dirty, a man whose mouth used to perform the vilest offices, was the heir of many, and also made many his heirs. What then? Was it his money that made him unclean, or did he himself besmirch his money? Money tumbles into the hands of certain men as a shilling tumbles down a sewer. Virtue stands above all such things. It is appraised in coin of its own minting, and it deems none of these random windfalls to be good. But medicine and navigation do not forbid themselves and their followers to marvel at such things. One who is not a good man can nevertheless be a physician, or a pilot, or a scholar. Yes, just as well as he can be a cook. He to whose lot it falls to possess something which is not of a random sort cannot be called a random sort of man. A person is of the same sort as that which he possesses. A strong box is worth just what it holds, or rather, it is a mere accessory of that which it holds. Whoever sets any price upon a full purse, except the price established by the count of the money deposited therein. This also applies to the owners of great estates. They are only accessories and incidentals to their possessions. Why then is the wise man great? Because he has a great soul. Accordingly, it is true that that which falls to the lot even of the most despicable person is not a good. Thus, I should never regard inactivity as a good, for even the tree frog and the flea possess this quality. Nor should I regard rest and freedom from trouble as a good, for what is more at leisure than a worm? Do you ask what it is that produces the wise man? That which produces a god. You must grant that the wise man has an element of godliness, heavenliness, grandeur. The good does not come to everyone, nor does it allow any random person to possess it. Behold, what fruits each country bears, or will not bear. Here corn, and there the wine, grow richlier. And elsewhere still the tender trees and grass, unbidden, clothe themselves in green. Seest thou how Timulus ships its saffron perfumes forth, and ivory comes from India. Soft Sheba sends its incense, and the unclad Calabes their iron. 
These products are apportioned to separate countries in order that human beings may be constrained to traffic among themselves, each seeking something from his neighbor in his turn. So the supreme good has also its own abode. It does not grow where ivory grows or iron. Do you ask where the supreme good dwells? In the soul. And unless the soul be pure and holy, there is no room in it for God. Good does not result from evil, but riches result from greed. Therefore, riches are not a good. It is not true, they say, that good does not result from evil, for money comes from sacrilege and theft. Accordingly, although sacrilege and theft are evil, yet they are evil only because they work more evil than good, for they bring gain, but the gain is accompanied by fear, anxiety, and torture of mind and body. Whoever says this must perforce admit that sacrilege, though it be an evil because it works much evil, is yet partly good because it accomplishes a certain amount of good. What can be more monstrous than this? We have, to be sure, actually convinced the world that sacrilege, theft, and adultery are to be regarded as among the goods. How many men there are who do not blush at theft? How many who boast of having committed adultery? For petty sacrilege is punished, but sacrilege on a grand scale is honored by a triumphal procession. Besides, sacrilege, if it is wholly good in some respect, will also be honorable and will be called right conduct for it is conduct which concerns ourselves. But no human being, on serious consideration, admits this idea. Therefore, goods cannot spring from evil. For if, as you object, sacrilege is an evil for the single reason that it brings on much evil, if you but absolve sacrilege of its punishment and pledge it immunity, sacrilege will be wholly good. And yet the worst punishment for crime lies in the crime itself. You are mistaken, I maintain, if you propose to reserve your punishments for the hangman or the prison. The crime is punished immediately after it is committed, nay, rather at the moment when it is committed. Hence, good does not spring from evil, any more than figs grow from olive trees. Things which grow correspond to their seed, and goods cannot depart from their class. As that which is honorable does not grow from that which is base, so neither does good grow from evil, for the honorable and the good are identical. Certain of our school oppose this statement as follows. Let us suppose that money taken from any source whatsoever is a good. Even though it is taken by an act of sacrilege, the money does not, on that account, derive its origin from sacrilege. You may get my meaning through the following illustration. In the same jar there is a piece of gold and there is a serpent. If you take the gold from the jar, it is not just because the serpent is there too, I say, that the jar yields me the gold, because it contains the serpent as well but it yields the gold in spite of containing the serpent also. Similarly, gain results from sacrilege, not just because sacrilege is a base and accursed act, but because it contains gain also. As the serpent in the jar is an evil, and not the gold which lies there beside the serpent, so in an act of sacrilege it is the crime, not the profit, that is evil. But I differ from these men, for the conditions in each case are not at all the same. In the one instance, I can take the gold without the serpent. In the other, I cannot make the profit without committing the sacrilege. The gain in the latter case does not lie side by side with the crime. It is blended with the crime. That which, while we are desiring to attain it, involves us in many evils is not a good. But while we are desiring to attain riches, we become involved in many evils. Therefore, riches are not a good. Your first premise, they say, contains two meanings. One is, we become involved in many evils while we are desiring to attain riches. But we also become involved in many evils while we are desiring to attain virtue. One man, while traveling in order to prosecute his studies, suffers shipwreck, and another is taken captive. The second meaning is as follows. That through which we become involved in evils is not a good. And it will not logically follow from our proposition that we become involved in evils through riches or through pleasure. Otherwise, if it is through riches that we become involved in many evils, riches are not only not a good, but they are positively an evil. You, however, maintain merely that they are not a good. Moreover, the objector says, you grant that riches are of some use. You reckon them among the advantages. And yet, on this basis, they cannot even be an advantage, for it is through the pursuit of riches that we suffer much disadvantage. Certain men answer this objection as follows. You are mistaken if you ascribe disadvantages to riches. Riches injure no one. It is a man's own folly or his neighbor's wickedness that harms him in each case. 
just as a sword by itself does not slay. It is merely the weapon used by the slayer. Riches themselves do not harm you, just because it is on account of riches that you suffer harm. I think that the reasoning of Posidonius is better. He holds that riches are a cause of evil, not because of themselves they do any evil, but because they goad men on so that they are ready to do evil. For the efficient cause, which necessarily produces harm at once, is one thing, and the antecedent cause is another. It is this antecedent cause which inheres in riches. They puff up the spirit and beget pride. They bring on unpopularity and unsettle the mind to such an extent that the mere reputation of having wealth, though it is bound to harm us, nevertheless affords delight. All goods, however, ought properly to be free from blame. They are pure, they do not corrupt the spirit, and they do not tempt us. They do indeed uplift and broaden the spirit, but without puffing it up. Those things which are goods produce confidence, but riches produce shamelessness. The things which are goods give us greatness of soul, but riches give us arrogance, and arrogance is nothing else than a false show of greatness. According to that argument, the objector says, riches are not only not a good, but are a positive evil. Now they would be an evil if they did harm of themselves, and if, as I remarked, it were the efficient cause which inheres in them. In fact, however, it is the antecedent cause which inheres in riches. And indeed, it is that cause which, so far from merely arousing the spirit, actually drags it along by force. Yes, riches shower upon us a semblance of the good, which is like the reality and wins credence in the eyes of many men. The antecedent cause inheres in virtue also. It is this which brings on envy, for many men become unpopular because of their wisdom, and many men because of their justice. But this cause, though it inheres in virtue, is not the result of virtue itself nor is it a mere semblance of the reality. Nay, on the contrary, far more like the reality is that vision which is flashed by virtue upon the spirits of men, summoning them to love it and marvel thereat. Posidonius thinks that the syllogism should be framed as follows. Things which bestow upon the soul no greatness or confidence or freedom from care are not goods, but riches and health and similar conditions do none of these things. Therefore, riches and health are not goods. This syllogism he then goes on to extend still farther in the following way. Things which bestow upon the soul no greatness or confidence or freedom from care, but on the other hand create in it arrogance, vanity, and insolence, are evils. But things which are the gift of fortune drive us into these evil ways. Therefore, these things are not goods. But, says the objector, by such reasoning, things which are the gift of fortune will not even be advantages. No, advantages and goods stand each in a different situation. An advantage is that which contains more of usefulness than of annoyance, but a good ought to be unmixed and with no element in it of harmfulness. A thing is not good if it contains more benefit than injury, but only if it contains nothing but benefit. Besides, advantages may be predicated of animals, of men who are less than perfect, and of fools. Hence, the advantageous may have an element of disadvantage mingled with it, but the word advantageous is used of the compound because it is judged by its predominant element. The good, however, can be predicated of the wise man alone. It is bound to be without alloy. Be of good cheer. There is only one knot left for you to untangle, though it is a knot for a Hercules. Good does not result from evil, but riches result from numerous cases of poverty. Therefore, riches are not a good. This syllogism is not recognized by our school, but the peripatetics both concoct it and give its solution. Posidonius, however, remarks that this fallacy, which has been bandied about among all the schools of dialectic, is refuted by Antipater as follows. The word poverty is used to denote not the possession of something, but the non-possession, or, as the ancients have put it, deprivation. For the Greeks use the phrase by deprivation, meaning negatively. Poverty states not what a man has, but what he has not. Consequently, there can be no fullness resulting from a multitude of voids. Many positive things, and not many deficiencies, make up riches. You have, says he, a wrong notion of the meaning of what poverty is. For poverty does not mean the possession of little, but the non-possession of much. It is used, therefore, not of what a man has, but of what he lacks. I could express my meaning more easily if there were a Latin word which could translate the Greek word which means not possessing. Antipater assigns this quality to poverty, but for my part, I cannot see what else poverty is than the possession of little. 
If ever we have plenty of leisure, we shall investigate the question, what is the essence of riches and what the essence of poverty? But when the time comes, we shall also consider whether it is not better to try to mitigate poverty and to relieve wealth of its arrogance than to quibble about the words as if the question of the things were already decided. Let us suppose that we have been summoned to an assembly. An act dealing with the abolition of riches has been brought before the meeting. Shall we be supporting it or opposing it if we use these syllogisms? Will these syllogisms help us to bring it about that the Roman people shall demand poverty and praise it, poverty the foundation and cause of their empire, and, on the other hand, shall shrink in fear from their present wealth, reflecting that they have found it among the victims of their conquests, that wealth is the source from which office-seeking and bribery and disorder have burst into a city once characterized by the utmost scrupulousness and sobriety, and that because of wealth an exhibition all too lavish is made of the spoils of conquered nations. Reflecting finally that whatever one people has snatched away from all the rest may still more easily be snatched by all away from one. Nay, it were better to support this law by our conduct and to subdue our desires by direct assault rather than to circumvent them by logic. If we can, let us speak more boldly. If not, let us speak more frankly. Farewell.